Um, thank you very much, everyone, <coughs> for coming today. Um, ooh, let me just get my talk up. By way of introduction, um, I'm going to do a sort of general overview of some of the FSAs uh, who are represented in the blue paper. So I did a sort of very initial analysis very initial, of um, blue papers between um, 1920 and 1945. So I'm going to be concentrating on that period. Um, and as a sort of introduction to me, uh, my interest is really in the social history of archaeology. So um, I'm going to talk about some women, but I'm going to focus on less well-known FSAs, um, because we've got some other papers covering other people who might be more well-known, and I think less well-known people have something interesting to say, well, I'm going to say something interesting, hopefully, about the less well-known people um, today. So, um, we heard from Jill about uh, the sort of pre-history, if you like, of women in the society, but I thought I would just bring out some newspaper coverage um, of women um, before 1920, when the first FSAs who were women were elected. Um, and so we have a mention uh, at the top left, right, left, whatever, over there, of um, Miss uh, Margaret Stokes contributing a paper. Um, so this is a note in the Academy from 1881. And like uh, Jill said, please do have a look at her amazing illustrations on the table. Um, but I also wanted to pull out some other examples. So we have um, Miss Oakover and Miss Talbot exhibiting at the same meeting or having things exhibited on their behalf uh, at the same meeting um, in 1889. And also um, Mrs. Cochran um, in uh, 1908. Um, and these are all also reflected in the proceedings of the society. So you get longer sort of um, uh, write-ups of their of their of their um, ex exhibitions in the proceedings, um, but I thought it was important just to flag up that these proceedings are also um, sort of being republished in in periodicals that are going out to a wider audience um, as way of by way of sort of introducing their names into the sort of more popular um, purview. Um, I should also just say that when I was doing the preliminary sort of research for this, I found that um, Margaret Stokes had a lecture series named after her in Dublin, which I thought was quite interesting. And that was um, published in the proceedings as well, just the fact that there was a lecture series, not you know, an introduction to it. Um, but I thought that was important to um, highlight here. I also wanted to highlight the fact that um, we have different kinds of uh, exhibition. So um, a Greek amphora fished up off a boat um, off, off the Greek coast, and also um, a more historical rather than an archaeological um, um, exhibition, so the, the 15th century Mazer. Um, so I did, a, like I say, a very preliminary draft analysis um, of women who are being proposed. This is not women who are being elected, just proposed. Um, from the blue paper records. And you can see that, you know, the numbers are not high. <laughs> um, although there was a big um, uptick in 1944, probably because there, you know, women are doing more stuff during the war. I don't know um, exactly. But I thought I would put over that um, the names of some more famous women and when they were being proposed um, according to the blue papers. So you can see um, some notable FSAs there. But like I say, I'm not really going to talk about these people because I'm interested in um, the other women who are being proposed um, and elected as FSAs. Um, but I thought it would be interesting to sort of contextualize this. So <clears throat> the first um, paper that appears in the minute books is for um, Eugenie Strong, who was the director, assistant director of the British School at Rome. So her um, honoris causa proposal um, is the 28th of April, 1920. And I like, um, I sort of reproduced on the slide, they had to cross out the 18 because it was, you know, an old, <laughs> an old paper. Um, but um, I've also put on this slide um, an example of something that um, Eugenia Strong was doing pr 
prior to her being elected. So she was writing articles summarizing excavations and archaeological activity in Rome um, during World War I on behalf of the director who was away on war work. Um, and I think this is a really interesting um, sort of example of women who are writing about archaeology for a popular audience. Um, and there are several examples of her letters to the Times um, summarizing archaeological um, excavations and uh, discoveries in Italy, one of which I'll come back to later on in the presentation, but it was um, the discovery in 1917 of an underground basilica in the Porta Maggiore, um, which uh, comes back in, in later on in the presentation. Um, so, one of the other women that I wanted to highlight um, whose blue paper is on display over there is Marjorie Venables Taylor. And one of the interesting things that comes out um, in this history um, is the fact that women were involved in very important administrative jobs. Um, and those are the jobs that are, in part, the reasons for which they are being um, put forward in the society. And it's really important to um, sort of realize that, that administration is a very important part of women's um, roles in, within archaeology, and it really brings them um, a sort of network that can help support their fellowship applications. Um, and you can see that her distinguished services to the study of Roman Britain and the fact that she's the secretary and editor of the um, Roman Society's journal is what's being flagged up here. <clears throat> and I also went through the blue papers that I had um, uh, photographs of and um, started to see whose blue, pa blue paper she was signing. Um, so you can see a sort of list of the ones that I found in my quick trawl. Um, and three of the women um, at the bottom there, Kathleen Kenny, and obviously we've heard about um, earlier in Jill's talk, Sylvia Benton I will come back to, and as will I, I will also come back to Dorothy McKay. Um, but I think it was interesting to see that she's not only signing the blue papers of women, she's also signing the blue papers of men. Um, and the picture that I, I put up um, is significant because, not because it's a picture of me, but because the picture is of Marjorie Venables Taylor's chair, um, which is in the Roman Society's office. Um, so because I don't have a picture of her, and if anyone has a picture of her, I'd love to see what she looks like, because one, <laughs> one of the things that uh, came out in a, a workshop that I put together uh, last year is the fact that it's really hard sometimes to find pictures of women. Um, and we want to find pictures of women because we're curious about what they looked like. And, you know, um, but So as an alternative, I put a picture of her chair online. But it's nice to know that her chair is still preserved in the office of the Roman Society to which she devoted so much time. So, we've also got um, Eliza Jeffries Davis. I picked her out because she's a historian, and I wanted to um, highlight the role of historians in the society. Um, she also was unusual in that she had um, an academic position. So she was uh, a lecturer and a, a reader, in fact, um, in, uh, at UCL of um, the History of London. Also, she's doing quite important editorial work as the editor of the Quarterly Journal of the Historical Association. Um, and then, uh, because I was trying to think about how women were being represented in the newspaper, I found this um, quite entertaining review of a lecture that she gave called The Parish Churches of the City in 1924, <coughs> is, uh, four years before she's proposed as uh, a fellow, in which she says, um, that uh, city churches were spoiled by modern painted glass. Um, and uh, she added that if anyone wanted to accomplish a good piece of work, he could do no better than to go smashing about, smashing the inferior windows of the city churches. So I'm not sure that she would have been um, praised by buildings conservatives for that view. But anyway, um, I thought it was an interesting um, reflection on her, um, her sort of ethos when it comes to conservation. Um, who else have we got? So, Sylvia Benton. Sylvia Benton um, was an archaeologist who worked primarily in Greece. Um, and uh, while I was um, thinking about this presentation, it just so happened that we had a volunteer at the Euro Museum who was going through 
um, a, a box file which is on display in a little um, display case we have that is a recreation of Percy Yore's desk. So um, Percy Yore was a professor of classics at Reading. Uh, he became the professor, professor of classics at, in 1911, and he married um, Annie Yore. And the Yore Museum has a really interesting archive of letters from um, lots of different archaeologists uh, who were working in Greece. And it just so happened that this box file that the volunteer was going through had some letters from Sylvia Benton in it. Um, so um, I, instead of having a picture of her, I thought I would put up a letter, which has just recently been um, discovered in the files at the Ur Museum, and it's about, um, she's writing to Percy Ur about um, an impending trip to Greece and um, submitting a photograph of some pottery that she has uh, been researching. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to flag up the importance of um, museums starting to look at their archives and learned society starting to look at their archives in terms of what this can tell us about women's work. Um, because I think it's really important to start a, get a handle on what is still there, um, floating around in museum um, files and uh, learner society files. And we can see a really um, lovely example of all the stuff that's been uh, waiting for us to take it out um, on display here today. So just a, a plea for um, people who are working in museums to um, to start shouting out when you find these um, letters and um, other evidence of women in archaeology, because it's really important. I mean, discoverability is really vital to the continuation of how we research um, these women. So plug for archives there. Um, Thalassa Henkin, Thalassa Crusoe, I wanted to um, flag up because uh, she was quite young when she was proposed as a fellow of the society, but she had done a lot of work. Um, she was working um, partly in the Museum of London as a costume um, curator, and partly as a field archeologist. So she, you can see um, in her qualification statement that she has um, experience in excavation at uh, Verulamium, Colchester, and Breeden, and she's doing that simultaneously um, as being a uh, curator in the London Museum. And um, I've pulled out just a quote here of the kind of work she was doing at Colchester, um, which was a dig that was directed in part by Christopher Hawkes, who was a, an FSA. Um, and there were a lot of women involved in the Colchester dig. It's a very interesting dig, and I'll come on to that um, in the next slide. But um, one of the other things that I wanted to point out was that she wrote this costume catalog um, as part of her role as uh, the curator in the London Museum. And there was a whole um, series of articles that were published about the production of this costume catalog on International Women's Day in 1934. Um, and you can see how it's being written, the girls' catalog, which is like a novel. I wouldn't go that far myself. Um, but you can see Thalassa Crusoe here in the catalog, dressed in one of the costumes I'm not sure that's good curatorial practice, to be perfectly honest, but <laughs> anyway, she's dressed in one of the, um, the uh, sort of mid-19th century um, costumes uh, that's featured in the catalog. The catalog also, I should say, has amazing illustrations by someone <coughs> called um, Marion Thorne, I think her name is, but they're fantastic, and I've un been unable to find anything out about this illustrator, but maybe in the Museum of London archives somewhere there is more. Um, the other thing I wanted to say um, about uh, Thalassa Crusoe, I'm not sure if we'll have time, but if we do, I'll, I'll put it up. But she um, moved to the U.S. and became a very noted garden um, expert. And she started publishing lots and lots of books about gardens. She also had a television series about gardens. Um, and so if you're interested in seeing Thalassa Crusoe Henkin on television, you can just um, put her name into YouTube and you'll see her being interviewed on Johnny Carson in the 1980s. Um, and I'll leave that for your enjoyment. Um, but it's very interesting. Um, and so I mentioned the Colchester excavations. Um, had a lot of women involved in it. And if you look at the publication of the Colchester excavations, um, which was uh, produced by the Society of Antiquaries, you can see a very long list of all the women who are involved in the excavation. So in the red boxes, I put um, P. 
people who became FSAs. But there are also lots of other women um, there, and, and men as well, I should just say. It wasn't just um, an excavation peopled by women, but um, there were quite a, more women by quite a significant number than men. So, um, but I just wanted to sort of take this opportunity to think about how an excavation like Colchester can um, show us how the archaeological network kind of worked. So we can pull it out and we can see that people from Colchester were working in other sites later on or while the excavations are happening. And that also connects us to more FSAs, Dorothy Liddell and Peggy Pickett, for example. And then I mentioned um, the Porta Maggiore Basilica, um, which was published by Nora Dollis, who worked at Colchester, um, and Eugenie Strong in 1924. Um, I know very little about Alison Young, um, but she interested me because she was being proposed in 1944 when um, you saw that big jump in the number of women who were being proposed in the society. Um, and actually, she wasn't successful at this stage in 1944 when she was um, proposed, but she was proposed again in 1952 when she got elected. Um, and she is also participating, uh, her occupation, as stated in the society, Blue Papers is given as a secretary of the Voluntary Aid Detachment Council. So she was working um, in the war effort um, when she was being proposed. But obviously she had quite a significant um, archaeological um, sort of, uh, she had quite significant archaeological um, work done that's being quoted here. So Maiden Castle. Um, Poundbury. She also excavated in Scotland, and a lot of her publications are um, through the Proceedings of the Society of Antiquaries in Scotland. Um, but I wanted to just um, highlight the fact that she was widowed in 1918, so I'm presuming um, that most of her archaeological work was done after her widowhood, or after her two lost her husband in, in the First World War. Um, and I wanted to end on uh, Dorothy McKay. Um, Dorothy McKay I, uh, is one of the women that I wrote about in my book, um, partly because she was very active in publishing um, for, uh, on archaeological matters. So one of the things that she wrote was a guide to the ancient cities of Iraq in 1926. This is when she and her husband, um, Ernest McKay, were working in Iraq at Kish. Um, and the guide is really interesting, and it's, I think, going to be on display somewhere in the society today. Um, and uh, it's really interesting because she basically follows the railway line. So it's a, it's a, a guide that's meant to um, enable people who are in Iraq, and this is Iraq at um, a time of British mandate, um, to navigate their way through the country to find the archaeological sites that were, in some cases, still being excavated. Um, and it's a, it's a tourist publication. And this um, interest in tourism continues. And one of the other things um, that, is, that is here in the society is a very small pamphlet that she wrote in the 1930s um, called Mahenjo Daro. And Mahenjo Daro is a quite famous Indus Valley site in um, what is now Pakistan. And uh, Dorothy and Ernest McKay were excavating there in the 1930s. Uh, and uh, this was a guide that was put together specifically for the Indian Railways Publications Office. Um, so uh, when I was doing my research for the book um, on Dorothy McKay and her, um, her popular writings, I wanted to make sure to include this very small pamphlet. And actually, the Society's copy was given to the Society by her. So it's a very nice um, sort of personal pamphlet. Um, I'm not entirely sure how widely the pamphlet was circulated, but there was, it was part of a series of pamphlets, pamphlets that were produced for the Indian State Railways uh, Publicity Office. So it fitted into a, a wider series. Um, and I didn't know this at the time that I was um, doing the research for the book, but later on in her life, she became a, a wartime curator at the Ashmolean Museum, as you can see in her um, blue paper citation. Um, and she also worked after the war and after the, the, the death of her husband in um, Beirut in the Archaeological Museum where she was a curator there. And she also wrote a guide which is 
in the society's uh, collection of the museum in Beirut. Um, that, I think, is all I have. Yes. Um, so thank you very much for listening, and I hope this has been...